Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Let us pray. Lord, let us always listen to your new commandment that we may love one another as you have loved us. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. So, it's Memorial Day weekend. It's not a time for mattresses and mattress sales, and it's not just the time that marks the beginning of summer where you can wear white now. It's Memorial Day weekend. Tomorrow is the celebration, the national celebration of Memorial Day. Now, I wanted to show you this. We think about the fallen, for those online. We think about those who lost their lives. There's Veterans Day in November and Memorial Day in May in this country. And, you know, sometimes I try to kind of bug people that to not confuse the two. You know, Veterans Day is Veterans Day and is a celebration of those who have served in the military or do serve in the military currently. And Memorial Day in May is those who gave their lives for their country. But, you know, if somebody comes up to a veteran and says, thank you for your service on Memorial Day, that's okay. <laughs> and they used to be mixed, and I will show you that. But before I do, I want to show you this. You know, in ancient times, when, when there was a tragedy, a crisis, something horrible happened, and loved ones died, or a king was lamenting the death of soldiers in battle, they would rend their clothes. The king himself would, what he was wearing, and put dust on his head. I'm not going to put dust on my head. <laughs> <laughs> but dust poured on their head, ripped their clothes, rend their clothes, dust on their head in mourning. It, and that was done pretty much as soon as you heard, no, and other people would do that. And then there were remembrances and things that would happen that way. Get my little friend over here with me. <laughs> okay. About, bless you, about 1,000 years B.C., before the birth of the Lord, was the time of King David. Before he was king, Saul, who was king of Israel, was chasing him all over the wilderness. Saul would take 3,000 men and just spend a lot of time, many days and months, going out throughout the land, trying to destroy David because he knew he was going to be the next king. And David, a mighty warrior, just would hide from him and get away from him and skirt the issue and never raise his hand against the Lord's anointed. There was a time when Saul had, and his 3,000 men were encamped, and Saul or, or paused at least in their journey seeking David. And Saul, the king of Israel, went into a cave out of the sun probably to nap, and David and his men were inside that cave. He had 400, 600 men, and they were in that cave. 
And David went up and cut the corner of Saul's robe off of his robe and then retreated back into the cave. He had the corner of Saul's robe. And so afterward, Saul, when Saul went out and he was out there with his army and moved, started to move away, David came out with his men and called to him. And Saul goes, is that your voice, my son, David? And, and he, said, he honored him and said, and held this up to show that, that he could have killed him. He said, you see what I have in my hand, but I would not raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. And he, Saul lamented, I don't know, I'm so, I, oh, you will be king. Surely you will be king, he said to David. And from that day forward, Saul continued to chase David in the wilderness. <laughs> but David always acknowledged, this is the king of Israel. And David was very extremely close friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. Closest of friends. And there was a battle David went and his people were staying in a village called Ziklag. And he had been off to, in battle. He came back. All of, all of the people who stayed behind from that battle, men, women, children, who couldn't go into battle, were gone. And many of their possessions were gone. And the place was burning. And it was the Amalekites. So Saul took his valiant men, 600, and went after them and, he, and recovered all, recovered all, brought all the people back and spoils from the Amalekites. We'll take your things, the spoils of war. And coming back, the 400 who went with him complained because 200 of them in that journey had stayed with the supplies at a brook, Brook Kidron, and the 400 went on and 200 stayed back with the supplies. When they came back from the victory, 400 men said, we should not share the spoils with these 200 who did not go into battle. And David said this. He established something back then. As his part is who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supplies. They shall share alike. First Samuel. And... That reminds me of those who serve in the military, but don't go into battle. And those who do go into battle, they're all, you know, there's an, an analogy that's put forward for people who serve in the military. It's called the blank check. A blank check, right, Frank? They, they've written a blank check, and you can cash it for any amount, any time. In other words, they will give their lives. They're willing to give their lives, even if they don't, even if they're not called to battle. Or if they go to battle, come back and didn't give their lives. And then there's those who did give their lives. They all went in with the same spirit of service, defense of loved ones and country. And some come back and some don't. Now the Philistines, 1 Samuel chapter 31. The Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. Then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons. And the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and Mount Kishua, Saul's sons. The battle became fierce against Saul. The archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. So Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together that day. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those who were on the other side of the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled. And the Philistines came and dwelt in their cities. And so it happened the next day when the Philistines came, they found Saul and his three sons on Mount Gilboa. And they stripped him of his armor 
and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temple of their idols and among the people. Then they put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths. There's no children here today. And they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. Now when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men rose, traveled all night, and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan, and they came to Jabesh. It happened back down in Ziklag after David's victory. A man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. And so it was, when he came to David, he fell on the ground and prostrated himself. And David said to him, where have you come from? So he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, how did the matter go? Please tell me. And he answered, the people have fled from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. And David took hold of his own clothes and tore them. And so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan, his son, for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. And David had lamented with, his lament, with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. And he told them to teach the children of Judah the song of the bow. Indeed, it is written in the book of Jasher, and I'm going to read most of the Song of the Bow, written by David, the psalmist and harpist for Saul. The beauty of Israel is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, Philistine city. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the Philistines triumph. O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew nor rain upon you, nor fields of offerings, for the shield of the mighty is cast away there, the shield of Saul, not anointed with oil. The bow of Jonathan did not turn back, the sword of Saul did not return empty. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. How the mighty have fallen. The Song of the Bow, a beautiful lamentation. take a break in a, in a little bit and I'm going to give some history of Memorial Day, Veterans Day turning into Memorial Day, and some concepts around self-sacrifice. From Revelation 19, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on, on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. All the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. In 1921, an unknown World War I American soldier was buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And similar ceremonies occurred earlier in England at Westminster Abbey and in France at the Arc de Triomphe, where an unknown soldier was buried in each nation's highest place of honor. These services all took place on November 11th, the anniversary of the end of World War I. November 11th at 11 a.m. It was the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month and in each of these countries, it came to be known as Armistice Day. In Canada, Remembrance Day. This first war, this global war, was called the Great War at the time. 
and was known as the War to End All Wars. But everything changed in the mid-40s, early and mid-40s. Another global conflict even of even greater proportions. In the aftermath of World War II, the United States Congress made a new resolution that all veterans of military service should be recognized and that Armistice Day would be known thereafter as Veterans Day here in this country. So Armistice Day started long before that, now called Veterans Day, November 11th. And in other nations, this day of remembrance is honored and is to honor those who lost their lives in the Great War. But in the United States, it's on Memorial Day in the month of May when we recognize those who have given their lives to our country. On Veterans Day, we acknowledge and honor those who have served our country in military service at any time. We honor the veterans of foreign wars. We honor the veterans of times of war who served not in combat, but in supportive and protective assignments. We honor the veterans in times of peace, but who wore the uniform to protect and defend our nation. Veterans Day is celebrated on November 11th, retaining the legacy of Armistice Day that signaled the end of the Great War. One might ask, is it right and proper to address these things in a service of worship? Don't we have community events to do so? Under flagpoles? In 1954, President Dwight Eisenhower made a proclamation concerning the newly named Veterans Day. It reads, Now therefore I, Dwight D. Eisenhower, President of the United States of America, do hereby call on our, all of our citizens to observe Thursday, November 11, 1954, as Veterans Day. On that day, let us solemnly remember the sacrifices of all those who fought so valiantly on the seas and the air and on foreign soils and shores to protect and preserve our heritage, our heritage of freedom. Let us re-consecrate our, ourselves to the task of promoting an enduring peace so that their efforts would not have been in vain. And he asked that this be done in places of worship. Eisenhower asked that it be done in places of worship, which is why I do it. The theme of love of country is not a rare thing for, for those of us who know the teachings of the Lord's new church and the new church in general. The Third Testament identifies love of one's country as something noble and good. To love one's country is to love all of its citizens and neighbors. The Lord himself is the source of all love and he teaches us to love our country as our homeland. And here, this is in true Christian religion. Wars that have as an end the defense of the country and the church are not contrary to charity. The end in view declares whether it is charity or not. Since therefore charity in its origin is goodwill and goodwill has its seat in the internal person, it is plain that when anyone who has charity resists an enemy, he does this by means of the external person. And therefore, after he has done it, he returns to the charity that resides in the internal person. And then, so far as he can, and so far as is useful, wishes them well. And from good will, Goodwill does good to the person. Those who have genuine charity have a zeal for what is good, and that zeal may appear in the external person like anger and flaming fire, but its flame dies out and is quieted as soon as the adversary returns to reason. It is different with those who have no charity. Their zeal is anger and hatred, for by these their internal person is heated and set on fire. PCR 407 and 408. In the United States, in the history of the United States, there have been way more than 40 million people who have served in military uniform. And more than 25 million are alive today, many who are serving in active duty today. And so we remember them 
and we honor their willingness to sacrifice their lives. This is called charity. These are both TCR. True Christian religion is under the heading of charity. And this is under the heading of charity, the doctrine of charity. It's called charity in the common soldier, in the, in the work of the word called doctrine of charity. Charity in the common soldier. If he looks to the Lord and shuns evils and sins and sincerely, justly, and faithfully does his duty, he becomes charity. For as to this, there is no distinction of persons. He hates the wrongful flow of blood. In battle, it is another thing. There he is not averse to it, for he does not think of it but the, as the enemy as an enemy who desires his own blood. When he hears the sound of the drum calling him to stop, the fury ceases. He looks upon his captives after victory as neighbors according to the quality of their good. Before the battle, he raises his mind to the Lord and commits his life into his hand. And after he has done this, he lets his mind down from its elevation into the body and becomes brave. The thought of the Lord, which he is then unconscious of, remaining still in his mind above his bravery. And then if he dies, he dies in the Lord. And if he lives, he lives in the Lord. Charity 166. And it's similar to the true Christian religion passage about after the battle, the thoughts are raised back into the internal and charity is given to those who were adversaries. And so how do we relate these things to, how do we relate these things to our own lives if we have not served in battle? I mean, not everyone here, most people here have not been in the military and some have. But does that mean you, you, you don't, does that mean you wouldn't if somebody came right now and started attacking your family, would you not fight? Or internally, someone attacks your beliefs, really attacks what you believe in attacks the Lord, attacks innocence, attacks your love of heaven viciously and wants to destroy this in you, would you not fight internally and battle against that? Well, that's what happens in our minds. This is why the Lord I read an image of the Lord with his robe dipped in blood, the armies around him, and that. <laughs> so... Um, and he's, he's a mighty hero of war. He's called this, so many images of him are that of a great warrior. The commander of the army of the Lord stood before Joshua. It was the angel of the Lord. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. I stand before you as the commander of the army of the Lord. Armies, wars, battles, the Lord of hosts, meaning those who battle armies. Why these images? It's because of the hells. Evil and falsity in each one of your minds, every, all of our minds, is trying to destroy what we believe in, destroy our love for the Lord and our love for the neighbor. These really are indeed being attacked in our minds, whether we see it or not, moment to moment, day by day. We don't see it per se. There are times when we feel it and do understand it. There are times when we're struggling against our own evils and falsities, where we recognize it and it comes to the surface and we go, this is a bad thing in me. This is not good. It will destroy others. This, I don't know what uh, example, this anger that I have raises up and hurts people and I need to fight against it. Anything in us that destroys or wants to destroy innocence or love for the Lord or the truths of the Lord's word, these things are in us. When we, we don't, we don't, we picture the Lord of hosts fighting against the hells and it's outside of us. It's not. Everything in the Lord's word is about the hells within us, fighting against all the heavens that, where, you know, heaven and earth meet in the human mind. 
each person's human mind. And this is where the battle takes place. And the Lord is the hero of war when we struggle through an evil temptation or a falsity. And you know, there aren't, so there aren't just, this is the, on the internal of all of this, we, we do, we honor the people who fought in war and died in war. But those who sacrifice to fight against their own evils and falsities because they were harming others, those are heroes of war. And we know somebody struggled through something and got through it and became a person who loves others and loves the Lord. We honor them as a hero of war because they're protecting the neighbor and they're protecting all that is good. Those are the ones who survive battling in war, in temptation. In Matthew, he who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends, the Lord said. In the internal sense, that does not mean laying down your life. Greater love has no one than this. In each one of you, in each one of us, than to lay down your life and sacrifice for others, to lay down your proprial life, your selfish life for the sake of others, to give over to others. When it hurts, give it over because you love them. That is the sacrifice that is being talked about. That's the laying down of life for one's friends, and it should be happening in all of our daily interactions when we give over for others and to the Lord. That is greater love. And so I want to just read this, and this is about Flanders Fields. Again, from World War I, there was a poem written. I started with a wonderful poem, as it were, written by David about Saul and Jonathan, called The Song of the Bow. Now, the one written about a friend who passed away in a battle in France before, right before World War I really was in, in full engaged in, engaged in. Written by a Canadian physician, Lieutenant Colonel John McRae. He was inspired to write it in 1915 after presiding over the funeral of a friend and fellow soldier, Lieutenant Alex Helmer, who died in the Second Battle of Ypres. It was first published on December 8th of that year. And now it's in common, it's, it's common in the English world. Flanders Fields is, means the battlefields of Belgium and France. Those are Flanders Fields. That's what it means. This is one of the most quoted war, poems of, from the war. It references the red poppies. Here we have poppies on the altar. The red poppies that grew over the graves of fallen soldiers. And so the poppy has become one of the world's most recognized memorial symbols of soldiers who have died in conflict. And so the poem and the poppy are prominent on Remembrance Day celebrations, Armistice Day celebrations, Veterans Day, well, Memorial Day for us celebrations of those who died in service to country. Here's the poem. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row. That mark our place, and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up your quarrel with the foe. To you from falling, failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. We are really blessed, truly blessed, to have in our faith teachings about dying because we don't die. 
Yes, loss is loss. We, we grieve loss deeply, the loss of our loved ones, because we're not with them. There's a loss. There's a big empty hole. And yet the comfort comes in the teachings of the Third Testament about life. We will all live to eternity. We will all be joined with our loved ones again. Arcana 10, 591. Human beings have been created in such a way that their inner self cannot die. For the human being is able to believe in God and also to love God and, to, and so to be joined to God in faith and love. And being joined to God constitutes life forevermore. And finally this, Arcana 4621. Being buried in the internal sense is rising again. And this is because when the body has died, the soul rises again. Hence, when burial is mentioned in the word, the angels do not think of the body, which is cast off, but of the soul, which rises again. For they are in spiritual ideas, thus in the things that belong to life. And therefore, all things that belong to death in the natural world signify such things as belong to life in the spiritual world. And so, I just want to say, it, yes, keep the distinction on Veterans Day in this country, which is Armistice Day in many other countries, and Remembrance Day in Canada. That's about, in their countries, a Memorial Day. But in our country, November 11th is Veterans Day. Acknowledge the veterans. Thank you for your service. But in May, Memorial Day is specifically for those who gave their life in service to their country. And that is something to think about in terms of their sacrifice, remembering about the blank check they all have. They sign a blank check and hand it to the, all the citizens, as it were. This, sign this check when I die. It's, you, it's yours. My life is yours. But, and then they don't. So honoring veterans is important, but acknowledging those who pass in service is important as well. In our lives together, honoring our, each other's service for each other is the same concept. It's the same concept. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it, it, it cannot rise again. Every, so many images of something dying, a kernel of wheat kind of dies. And what happens? Growth. And the Lord is always giving us images of rebirth, regrowth, and all of it is to say, we never die. Grace be to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, the almighty and everlasting God. Amen. Please be seated. I just want to just revisit a couple of words. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. <laughs>